Hi, I'm Sarah Clear with the Rediscovery Centre and we are delighted to be hosting the Great Irish Zoo Off event today. We'd like to thank Photo Wildlife Park and Galway Atlantic Aquaria for taking part in the event today. And this event was very kindly funded by Science Foundation Ireland as part of our STEM and sustainability project. So the purpose of today's event is to find out more about biodiversity and learn about how science, technology, engineering and maths can help to conserve biodiversity. For centuries, there's been a huge debate about which is better, land or sea. When we asked Photo Wildlife Park, they said land. When we asked Galway Atlantic Aquaria, they said sea. So we decided the only way to settle this age old question was to hold the great Irish zoo off land versus sea. And then later in the comments, you can let us know which one you choose. So we're going to go to each, um, so each of the zoos in turn, and we're going to show us a different animal. Please feel free to put comments and questions on YouTube um, on the link below. Um, and remember, keep it kind, keep it clean, and no unacceptable comments or behaviors. And towards the end, we're gonna do a live questions and answers session. Um, and you can ask your questions of Photo Wildlife Park and Galway Atlantic Aquarium. So I'd like to introduce Linda from Photo Wildlife Park. Good morning, Hi, Linda, everyone. How are you? Good morning, Sarah. Doing, doing well, thank you. And you? Good, good. Thanks. Very excited to be here today. Do you want to tell us a little bit about Photo Wildlife Park? Yes, the, the Wildlife Park was first opened to the public back in June of 1983. So this year, thankfully, we're celebrating our 38th anniversary. The park is of charitable status uh, and we're a not-for-profit organisation as well. And, and, and perhaps what a lot of people may not recognise is that Photo Wildlife Park is a joint project between University College Cork and the Zoological Society of Ireland as well. So, so some really good connections there. We're home to just over 140 different faunal or animal species, and that accounts for almost 13, in or around I suppose 1,350 animals are currently in our care here in the Wildlife Park as well. So uh, a huge cost, um, very exciting place to work, let it be said, and some amazing animals that everyone's going to get to learn about over the next hour or so. Fantastic, and it's a fantastic place to visit as well. I've been down quite a few times. Must go again now that we can actually finally get get to go to different counties. So now I'd like to introduce Noreen and ask her a little bit about Galway Atlantic Aquaria. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Noreen. Hi, How Linda. Are you today? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. Do you want to tell us a little bit about Galway Atlantic Aquaria? Yeah, no problem. So Galway Atlantic Aquaria is a native species aquarium on the west coast of Ireland. We're based just outside Galway City in Salt Hill. Um, we're not quite as old as Photo Wildlife Park. Uh, we opened back in 1999 and our focus is really on native species that live in the rivers and the oceans around Ireland. Oh, fantastic. And another fantastic place to visit as well. Now that people can get outside their, their 5K. Yeah, it's good. Absolutely. So are we ready to go? Are we ready for the great Irish Zoo off land versus sea battle to commence? Bring Absolutely. It <laughs> so we're going to start with Photo Wildlife Park. And Linda, do you want to tell us a little bit about um, what you're going to be talking about for your first um, for your first animal? So coming up in this video, it's all about one of Ireland's critically endangered species, the Natter Jack Toad. And Will Duffy, uh, one of our lead rangers here in Photo Wildlife Park, is going to give you a little bit more information about them. Hi, my name is Will Duffy and I'm part of the animal care team here at Photo Wildlife Park and also the education department. Today I want to show you how STEM is helping with Ireland's rarest toad, the Natter Jack Toad. It is the only species of toad in Ireland of the three amphibians found. It's quite distinctive from the common frog. The common frog has longer legs, which it hops, whereas the Natterjack toad has shorter legs, which it kind of shuffles along. But most importantly, it's quite unique because it has a, a yellow line down its back from its head to its back. The Natterjack toad is only found in the southwest part of Ireland, which is a Kerry and mostly around the Dingle Peninsula. The habitat the Natterjack toad likes is coastal, sand dune, heaty areas. The reason for its decline is because of 
man-made really agricultural and it's the draining of its habitat so a little bit about the nanojack toad and the year in life of the toad uh, it spends a lot of the winter uh, underneath the ground uh, it can dig into the sand dunes in beaches around the carrier and also into mud uh, they emerge from their winter hibernation uh, between March and April when the weather starts and temperatures start to rise uh, then all the nanojack toads head to uh, water freshwater ponds which is driven by environmental factors and single females can lay up to 5,000 eggs of which maybe two to five survive in the wild so how is STEM helping us here in Fort Wildlife Park well together with the National Parks and Wildlife Service and Dingle Aquarium uh, scientists and biologists go out to the fields and together in conjunction with uh, local farmers local farmers now have dug ponds in the area and they maintain the ponds such as making sure there is water there provided in the springtime for the toads and also the grass grown around the ponds is maintained that it's not left for too long because the toads like to feed on beetles and insects so scientists and uh, biologists and with the help of national parks and wildlife service they collect up some strings of eggs and tadpoles and they bring them in here to photo wildlife park and also dingle aquarium and here we will have a look at our setup and how stem helps us so what we do is with the eggs they go into basins of water and on a daily basis just like in the wild where you have fresh water we would uh, clean out the water every day a certain percentage of it uh, also we add heaters so this is the technology side of it where we can control the temperature and this helps with the hatching of the egg to the tadpole when the tadpoles starts developing their leg uh, into toadlets uh, within a few weeks we will once they're reared we will release them back to the wild So why do we do all this uh, conservation work with the nanojack toads? Well, as I said earlier, it is Ireland's rarest amphibian. It's critically endangered in Ireland. And if we didn't do this, it would go extinct. So together with scientists, National Parks and Wildlife Service, farmers, we are helping the species survival. Uh, to date, within the last five years, Fort Wildlife Park has sent back, in the last five years, nearly 6,000 toadless. So, Together with STEM, biologists and science and technology, we hope to maintain the survival of this species. Now I wish to hand you over to our colleagues in Galway. The Nadejak toad, what a fantastic animal. I suppose most people living in Ireland, Sarah, know very little about the Natterjack toad. And, and I have to admit that I too was one of those until they arrived here in Fota. Um, but just seeing how much, I suppose, the time and effort that goes into to the captive breeding here in Fota Wildlife Park, but most importantly, the fact that we're involved in, in the rewilding, reintroduction of these back into to locations like Kerry is just so, so impressive. Uh, and Will and all of the team here in the park are completely dedicated to continue that project with the National Parks and Wildlife Service. Absolutely, and so important. And just seeing those toadlets being released back into the wild was amazing. And I have to say, my favourite thing about it was it's go faster, Stripe. <laughs> I think that is probably, as Will would have mentioned, it's probably one of the most distinctive features that they have. But I know when we've reared them here, it's just amazing to see how long it actually takes them to mature that they go from very, very small toadlets, but they seem to take ages to actually reach full adult size at the same time. So it's, it's a labour of love here in Photo Wildlife Park. Absolutely. Galway are going to be hard pressed to try and beat the Natterjack toad. Well, I was just going to say there's a lot of water involved in that, but, you know, I don't want to say too much. Uh, yeah, I think we have some incredible animals to show you next. My colleague Anna would like to introduce you to some members of the echinoderm family. Now, that might be a new word to people. I think it sounds really cool, actually, echinoderms. But you're going to see some uh, fairly familiar not faces, but uh, animals on the next clip as Anna shows you around some of the animals at the aquarium. 
we're going to have a look at a group of animals called echinoderms. This word comes from the Greek words echino, meaning spiny, and derm, meaning skin. Our first spiny skin sea creature is probably one of the most iconic and recognisable of all the seashore species. It is, of course, our common starfish. Its soft skin is covered in small spines, and it can range in colour from oranges to light purple. Starfish usually have five arms, and at the end of each of their arms, they have what we call an eye spot. They can't see as well as you or I can, but they can tell the difference between light and dark, which is really important if you are a starfish living in a rock pool on a sunny day. The starfish can shelter in the darker spots away from the hot sun. On the underside of their bodies, they have hundreds of tube feet, or podia. Each foot has a suction cup on the end. They use their podia for breathing, feeding, and as you can see here, moving. Starfish are scavengers, which means they'll eat pretty much anything they can get their podia on, but they especially love to eat crabs and shellfish. The starfish will use its strong tube feet to pry open a mussel shell. Its mouth is in the center of its body and is much smaller than the mussel. So what it has to do is extend its stomach out of its mouth and into the mussel shell, where it will digest its flesh outside of its body. And when it's done, it will slurp it all back into its body again. Delightful. You may not recognize our next echinoderm, the sea cucumber. This is a time-lapse video, so this sea cucumber is moving much faster than it does in reality. It has the same tube feet that we saw on the starfish, which allows it to stick to the rocks where it's found in the wild. It's a suspension feeder, which means it uses its mucus-covered tentacles to filter particles out of the water and into its mouth, and that's what you can see it doing here. The sea cucumber is a slow-moving, soft-bodied creature, which leaves it quite vulnerable to pred predation, but it has an amazing defense mechanism. When attacked, it will shoot out part of its sticky intestines, entangling its attacker, allowing it to escape slowly. Don't worry though, the sea cucumber will grow its intestines back, just like a starfish can regrow its arms when they get damaged or broken. It's clear to see why this next creature fits into the spiny skinned echinoderms. This purple sea urchin lives in rock pools all along the coast of Ireland. Its mouth, which is on the underside of its spiny body, is equipped with a complicated structure called an Aristotle's lantern, which is composed of five hard teeth, which it uses to scrape algae and other encrusting species off the rocks. If you look closely, you can see the trail of scratch marks this urchin has left on the rocks where it had been enjoying its dinner. It's really important to monitor our native species on the seashore and in the ocean. Scientists can do this in many ways using simple and not so simple forms of technology. An example of using state-of-the-art technological equipment is Smart Bay Observatory which is located underwater off Spittle in County Galway. The observatory uses cameras, probes and sensors to collect real-time data such as water temperature, pH and salinity. From the video footage, scientists can monitor what species can be found off our coast. You don't always need state-of-the-art equipment in species monitoring though. The next time you are exploring at the beach or rocky seashore and you find any animals stuck to or hiding under rocks and seaweeds, Note your location and take a photo and submit your data to the National Biodiversity Centre's Explore Your Shore. This project uses the valuable information that you gather to monitor changes in the distribution of our native species over time, which helps scientists to study the effects climate change is having on our ocean. So incredible to see the uh, starfish family, the echinoderms. Yeah, and I have to, I absolutely love the sea cucumber. It's like the lesser known cousin of the starfish. Uh, it doesn't get quite as much of like, you know, news pieces, but 
an incredible animal as well. Absolutely. And the fact that it ejects its stomach to um, <laughs> as a defense against predators, <laughs> incredible. I wouldn't love it. <laughs> exactly. So, Linda, what do you think? Do you think you can outdo? I think it's going to be a hard act to follow, Sarah. I think we've we've learned some amazing facts about some of those marine uh, and aquatic species. And um, so well done, Galway Atlantic Query. You've raised the bar, let it be said. Um, <laughs> next with us, I think most people are more than aware of the fact that Photo Wildlife Park is home to a huge variety of exotic species. Uh, but in our next video, my colleague Rachel Taylor will explain about the importance of STEM in actually conserving one of Ireland's most important mammal species, which is the red squirrel. Thank you so much to the team in Galway Land Aquaria for showing us how you use STEM in your collection with regards to the animals that you have on site. So now we're back to Photo Wildlife Park. Hi, my name is Rachel. Have you ever wondered how we learn more about the red squirrels here in Photo Wildlife Park without interfering with their environments or stressing these wild animals out? We might be lucky on occasion to see one or two red squirrels foraging on the ground, but is that enough time for us to learn if they are boys or girls or if they're sick or if they're healthy? Not really. So what else can we do? Well, we need a scientific way to get some of their DNA without causing them stress or harm. But before I show you what we do, I'm going to briefly explain what DNA is. So what is DNA? Well, DNA is short for deoxyribonucleic acid, and it is the code that determines all the characteristics of living things. Put simply, it is what makes you, you. It is a very long molecule that is found in most of the cells in our body. It is most definitely not visible to the naked eye, but today I've made a model out of sweets to show you its shape. In science, this shape is known as a double helix. It looks a bit like a twisted ladder. If we stretch the DNA out of one cell in our body, it would be two meters in length. And this is divided into different sections called genes. Each gene is responsible for different features. For example, this part might be to do with what color eyes you have. This part lower down might be the gene for whether or not you can taste cucumber. If we can get the DNA from the red squirrels, it can tell us a lot about their family tree, who is related to who, whether they're boys, whether they're girls, or looking at their general health. How we do this is we use these special devices called hair tubes. I'm going to show you an example of one right now. Perfect, so this is an example of a hair tube and this is what wildlife biologists use to get some hair from various mammals in the habitat that they are studying. So this example is made from a short length of pipe. It has two wooden inserts at each end of the pipe and there is a layer of sticky paper attached to the wooden insert. We place food in the form of peanuts in the middle of the pipe and we ensure that the wooden plates are attached, as I mentioned, at the entrance and the exit of the pipe. These pipes are then placed up high in the trees and the squirrel will go looking for food inside the pipe. And whilst it's in there, some of its hair will get caught in a sticky trap. So these hair tubes were used as part of an important project in the wildlife park to learn more about red squirrels in the absence of gray ones. As you may know, red squirrels are our only native squirrel. 12 gray squirrels were introduced into a woodland in County Longford in 1912 as part of a wedding present. They have spread rapidly and are found widespread throughout most of the island of Ireland but are still absent from South Cork. This makes populations of red squirrels, such as those at Photo Wildlife Park, particularly important. So the grey squirrels do not directly kill the red squirrels, but what they do is they outcompete them for resources such as food. In early autumn, they strip the trees bare of nuts and, and berries, and when the red squirrel comes looking for food later on in the season, there's no food left. So the grey squirrels are vectors or carriers for a contagious disease called the squirrel parapox virus. The red squirrels are highly susceptible to the disease, but it has no effect whatsoever on the grey squirrels. And that is why this project is so important. The information gathered will help us to improve habitats for the red squirrels here at Photo Wildlife Park and also further afield. So, what have we learned from the project? Well, we know that we have a population of at least 50 red squirrels here in the wildlife park. Um, we know this from the genetic analysis carried out by the scientists in WIT. The red squirrels here in Fota have an extensive home range, but the area they favour the most is actually where we're standing right now. In particular, we've discovered that their favourite tree species on site is the yew. 
So the red squirrels are very popular here in the wildlife park with our visitors, but they may not always be visible, particularly in the winter months when they have short periods of inactivity to avoid extremes of cold or food shortage. This is known as torpor. Torpor is a survival tactic used by squirrels to survive the winter months. Here in Fota, we supplement their diet with high energy foods such as peanuts, which we place in these special squirrel feeders, which are located in various trees around the park. You might be lucky enough to spot a squirrel having a well-deserved snack on your next trip to the park. Okay everyone, we're going to head back over to our colleagues in Galway Land Aquaria to learn some more interesting facts about the animals that they have. Incredible how much information um, that scientists can gather from the DNA from hares. Absolutely, Sarah, and a really, really important project to, to us to obviously safeguard the red squirrel population here as well. And I think the studies that were carried out here in photo were obviously of national importance. So, yeah. so just one of the many ways that STEM has helped to conserve species, both on a national and a global scale. Absolutely. And great to see the squirrel feeders as well helping to support our native red squirrels too. Something really nice that maybe schools or communities could do. Absolutely. Anyone who visits the park will have an opportunity to see those here adjacent to our education centre. Brilliant. Now, Galway, the pressure is on. What animal are you going to show us next? I don't know how we're going to match that. I seriously love red squirrels. They're like one of my favourite animals. Um, okay, so it's going to be me next and I am going to take you into the aquarium this time because I want to show you a little bit about how STEM, science, technology, engineering and maths can impact on fish. There are over 25,000 different species of fish in the world. They come in all different shapes and sizes. With roughly 71% of the Earth's surface covered in the ocean, there's lots of room for them to swim. Now here in Ireland, we have over 500 species of marine fish. They include bony fish, whose skeleton is made from bone, cartilaginous fish, whose skeleton is made of cartilage, like sharks and rays and skates, and jawless fish, such as hagfish and lamprey. Oi, here's Eddie. He's a wreckfish and his skeleton's made of bone. Fish are really important as food around the world. Around one in every seven people get their main source of protein from the sea. That can come from fish like these, but also from crustaceans such as crabs and lobsters and shellfish such as mussels and cockles and clams. There are different ways that we catch fish. Angling is usually done for sport or leisure and it's where we catch animals with a rod and line. Commercial fishing is where we use a net and these can come in a whole variety of different sizes from different size vessels. And aquaculture is when we farm animals, generally in pens, they can be on land or in sea. These sea bass that we can see here at the aquarium came from a fish farm. So these are an example of a farmed fish. Now, this brings me on really nicely to this little cutie. These are lump suckers. Lump suckers are lump fish get their name from the sucker that's found on the bottom of their body. While this is a wild species, it is now being farmed to be used on fish farms, so not to be eaten itself. It gets used as a biological solution to natural parasites such as sea lice that can sometimes cause trouble on fish farms. It's a wonderful example of a natural solution where scientists have found a way to combat this problem. This is another fish that gets bred as a cleaner fish. This is wrasse. Wrasse are one of the most colourful fish that we get in Irish waters. Commercial fishing is when we catch fish for food to sell, such as all the examples we can see here at the fish shop. Fishing can be a hard business. This is a bit of footage that was sent to us from Gerald Foley down in County Wexford. Here we can see our net being brought in on the back of his fishing vessel, the Eddy, but it's on a reasonably calm day. Fishing is really important for our coastal communities. Hi Porig. Porig is showing us some samples of nets that we got from Bordi Shkiwara. 
Here we can see that they have different mesh sizes. So that's the size of the hole between the pieces of net. And also they can be used in different orientation or directions, which means as the net gets pulled, different size animals will be able to escape through the net and possibly even different shapes as well. So it's a great example of engineering and design. Here we can see a pot. These are also designed to target certain animals, such as crabs and lobsters, where other animals that we don't want to catch will be able to escape through the openings. Now, this is a really nice example of design. This is an escape section, which gets added to nets so that smaller fish can get through. Thanks, Borg. Great example of how that works. We also have a lovely panel here from a prawn net. In this net, the animals go in the top and this grid is used to select just the larger animals where the smaller ones can swim and escape back into the ocean. So the next time you go out shopping, think about buying local and in season from your local fishing community. That was great to see, and those lump suckers with the suction cups on their underside act as cleaner fish. They're so cute. And do you know our ones actually came from, so our lump suckers aren't from the wild, they're from a research centre where they were exploring how to breed lump suckers um, oh. for, for fish farms. And I suppose we're just so conscious, we're a small venue, you know, our aquarium, and what we try to do is, show people the impact they can have on the ocean through their daily actions so sustainable fisheries is really important for our oceans and for our stocks you know absolutely and the incredible engineering of those nets as well and the escape hatches i mean so important just to catch uh, the target species rather than every single living thing so next, really excitingly, we are going straight to Linda, who was down by the bison enclosure, and she's going to tell us a little bit more about the bison. This morning, we're going to introduce you to our bison herd here to my far, far right hand side, just out in our main paddock. The European bison, or visant, as they're commonly known as, is Europe's largest land mammal and was once widespread across Western and Eastern Europe. Uh, adult males, or bulls, can grow to a height of just up to 1.9 metres, uh, a length of 3 metres, and weigh anything up to 1,000 kgs. Yet, despite their size, bison, believe it or not, are capable of jumping a 3 metre wide stream from a standing position. So one amazing feat on their behalf as well. So where do we find bison in the wild? Well, in the wild, bison prefer to live in deciduous and mixed forests um, with open grasslands and low-lying vegetation. They're herbivores, which means that they feed on plants. And in recent decades, scientists have discovered that they can actually consume up to 200 different types or varieties of plants. Um, they leave foods such as leaves, bark, acorns, lichens, mosses and shrubs, for example. The breeding season for bison, when does that happen? Generally falls between August and October, with calves being born roughly nine months later as well. Bison first arrived in Photo Wildlife Park in 1999, and since then, 55 calves have actually been born here. A number of bison have been released into the wild, uh, into a number of locations in Europe in recent years, uh, directly through Photo Wildlife Park. And they include locations such as Boa Vieja Forest in Poland back in 2008. And more recently in 2016, we've released a further seven European bison back into Val de Serralis Nature Reserve in Spain. And they were joined by a number of animals, five in total, from Port Lim and Howlett's Wildlife Park in the UK as well. So you may ask why are such large mammals kept in captivity in places such as Photo Wildlife Park? And the sad reality is that back in 1927, the European bison became extinct in the wild. And this was largely due to overhunting by humans and habitat destruction as well. However, at that time, 54 European bison were kept in a number of collections in Europe. And thankfully, due to captive breeding methods, uh, it has secured and ensured the bison long-term survival here as well. So once an animal is released back into the wild, how do we know where it's located? How do we even know whether or not it's safe? Well, simple answer is that for decades, the only way in which we could actually watch or track wildlife was to follow and watch the movement and habits of an animal or to capture an animal and put a tag in it and hope that at some time in the future that the same animal would be recaptured at some point as well. 
So once the calves are two days old, the rangers in Photo Wildlife Park, they attach identification tags to their ears and each animal will have its own unique identification number, which is easily spotted by wildlife biologists in the wild as well. However, in recent decades, science and technology has advanced and nowadays we use a microchip, similar to what you would find in a domesticated dog or cat to allow for ease of identification. So a microchip, which is roughly the size of a grain of rice, uh, is inserted between the shoulder blades of the calf and then using a handheld scanner, once inserted, we can scan across the animal's back and that automatically will show up or identify the animal. We hold those identification records on a database here in Photo Wildlife Park called ZIMS, which is the Zoological Information Management System. And there are about a thousand uh, approved zoos worldwide that actually use this system as well. However, since 1963, we've been very fortunate to have VHF radio tracking. What is it? Effectively, in order to use VHF radio tracking, a radio transmitter is placed on the animal. Usually the animal is first sedated. While the animal is asleep, the scientists gather information about the health and condition of the animal. The radio transmitter is normally attached to a collar and placed around the animal's neck. It then begins to transmit or start sending signals uh, to a radio antenna and subsequently a receiver. In order to locate an animal in the wild using VHF radio tracking, scientists must be close, close enough to the animal with the radio antenna so they can pick up the signal from the radio transmitter on the animal itself. Scientists on the ground using an antenna and receiver can then locate and follow the signal. You can even follow the signal uh, from a plane in the air, for example. Thank you so much for that, Linda. It was absolutely brilliant to see the bison in their enclosure. And it's incredible to think that Europe's largest land mammal can jump a three meter wide stream. Whoa. Um, and it's also really, really great to see just how science, technology, engineering and maths can actually help to reintroduce a species that's gone extinct in the wild. Galway, you're going to have a lot to live up to trying to beat that one. Yeah, yeah, I, I'll be honest. I, I don't think I can I can cap that one. And fair play to Linda and to Rachel and the guys down in Florida. Those are just some incredible stories. And the breeding programs that happen in zoos and aquariums around the world, it's just fantastic, isn't it? Yeah. Um, we are going to show you an animal next that does have a little bit in common with a bison, not the three meter jump across the stream bit though. <laughs> but it does use tags as well. And I think that is another great example of the use of technology is how we can monitor species without even getting too close to them. So my colleague Porig is going to introduce you to the story of Leon, a loggerhead turtle that was discovered on a beach down in County Clare. Hello everyone. Today I want to talk to you a little bit about sea turtles and how these amazing animals are being helped by people in STEM all over the world. There are seven species of sea turtle currently known to swim the oceans. Here in Ireland, we can see five of them in our waters. They are the leatherback, loggerhead, green, Kemp's Ridley, and Hawksbill. As reptiles, sea turtles breathe air and not water. So when you see them navigating underwater currents, munching on jellyfish, or dashing away from predators, they are in fact holding their breath. They lay their eggs on land, and their babies, when hatched, must find the ocean, usually only returning to land in order to lay their own eggs. It isn't all plain sailing for these shelled sea creatures. Occasionally, due to storms, illness, or injury, a sea turtle may be washed up to the shore unable to save itself. Sea turtle numbers are low around the world, with nearly every species of sea turtle classified as endangered. Thankfully, science, technology, and engineering along with a dash of compassion from those who rescue these stranded animals, have all come together to help us understand and save sea turtles all over the world. When washed up on the shore, turtles can suffer visible and invisible problems. Physical damage to their body and shell is often the case. They can also have internal problems that can lead to buoyancy issues. This means it can be weeks before they are able to dive below the surface of the water. 
In the wild, this will be fatal for them. But thankfully, with the right care and medical treatment, they can make a full recovery. Sea turtles are strong and resilient animals. Given half a chance, they can return from the brink of death to live long, healthy lives. I've actually been lucky enough to see this happen. Once properly taken care of, their injuries can heal, their illnesses pass, and their zest for life can return stronger than ever. It is important to x-ray any rescued turtles if possible. This allows us to ensure they have no internal rubbish. Turtles can mistake rubbish for food and eat it accidentally. Without proper care, this can make them very sick. This all sounds like the compassion you mentioned, I can hear you ask. What about the science and the technology and the engineering? Well, once a rescued sea turtle has recovered its strength and it comes time to release it back into the ocean, what will often happen now is a state-of-the-art tag can be placed on its shell. This tag causes no discomfort to the turtle whatsoever, but what it does do is provide us a treasure trove of information on how these animals live their lives in the wild. Using this tag, we can find out where they live, breed, feed, how deep they can dive, how far they like to travel, almost everything we want to know. Knowledge is power, and with enough knowledge, we will have enough power to ensure that sea turtles can survive on this earth as they were meant to. There are multiple ways of releasing these creatures back into the wild after being rescued. You can release them from the shore or from the open ocean itself. So what can you do to help these amazing animals? Well, firstly, we want to protect their home, which is the ocean. So the more that we protect the oceans, the more chance that sea turtles have to survive happily in the wild. If you find one washed up on a beach or onto the shore, well, there are a number of different places you can call that should be able to help. The Irish Whale and Dolphin Group will offer advice on how to take care of them on the beach and also call the relevant people who can look after them. You could also get in contact with your local seal sanctuary or the closest aquarium to where you found the turtle. Any one of those places will be able to offer help and advice and will be able to contact whoever needs to be contacted in order to help rescue these amazing animals. Thank you. Wow, it's brilliant that five different species of sea turtle are found in Irish waters. I know, I know. And I suppose because they don't generally come up on our shore, we don't want them to come up on the shore, um, we don't really see them necessarily. You know, it's only people maybe who are out diving or working off the shore a bit that actually get to see these incredible animals. But it, it is amazing. And we've been so lucky to be involved in a number of projects where uh, turtles were rehabilitated and released. And other organizations in Ireland have been as well. I know Dingle have looked after turtles. And the Irish Seal Sanctuary does amazing work as well at rehabilitating animals and releasing them. Absolutely. And it's great to know what the public can do as well. You know, what they should do if they find a stranded turtle. So, Linda, you're back from the bison enclosure. That was an incredible video. Great to see them as well. Absolutely, Sarah. And great to see, uh, I suppose, the, the huge amount of rehabilitation work that's ongoing with organisations like Galway Atlantic Quarry as well. Very, very impressive, no doubt. Absolutely. So do you think you're going to be able to beat the sea turtles? Hmm, I'm just wondering, have I actually saved the best for last? I suppose oh. that maybe will be down to the audience voting later on. But as I said in the past, it's an extremely hard act to follow. Galloway Atlantic Quarry have always done an amazing job. And what I've seen here so far, I'm super impressed. So in the next video, we're going to introduce you in our final video. We're going to introduce you to the ways in which STEM have actually helped us to enrich and improve the captive environment for the world's fastest land mammal. And I think all of you know who I'm referring to. Of course, it's the African cheetah. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Photo Wildlife Park. My name is Donald and I'm a member of the education team here in Photo. And this morning we're going to tell you a bit about how STEM helps us to enrich the environment of the fastest land animal in the world, the cheetahs that you can see behind them here. So most of 
Most people will already be familiar with the fact that cheetahs are the fastest land mammal in the world, capable of reaching speeds over 100 kilometers an hour on just their four legs alone. But what you might not be aware of for all the different adaptations to their body, that's the changes that have occurred over long periods of time, uh, is part of their evolution to allow them to reach such speeds. First off, they are much smaller than the other big cats that we have here in the park, like our lions and our tigers. The average cheetah will weigh about 30 to 35 kg. So if they are very light, it means they're light on their feet. If anyone has a pet cat at home, you will know that the domestic cat's claws go all the way back into their paw. They're what's called retractable, and that's the case for every cat in the world, except for the ones behind me. So they have semi-retractable claws, which means they're always slightly out, giving them excellent grip on the ground when they're running. Um, as well as that, they have a very flexible backbone, so they can fold their whole spine, essentially allowing them to get their hips up underneath their shoulders and their back legs underneath their front legs, using their entire body as a spring. So in one single stride, when a cheetah's at full pace, they can clear five to seven meters without touching the ground. Past that then, they have a long tail, but they use that basically like the rudder at the back of a boat. It's how they steer themselves. So if they're chasing something very nimble, very agile in the wild, they want to be able to stay on their heels when they turn as well. Um, because that will help them to catch their kill. After that, if you take a look at their eyes, you will see what are called tear marks, the black lines that come down from their eyes to the corner of their mouth. They act, essentially act as sunglasses for a cheetah. They draw the glare of the sun away from their eyes and prevent them from being blinded while they're chasing. Because for a cat, they actually don't have excellent um, sense of smell like most cats would, but they do have very, very good eyesight. So the chances are, if they can see it, there's a good chance that they will be able to catch up with it. And then apart from those external features, they also have very wide nasal cavities to allow them to get loads of oxygen into their body. They have a very large heart and lung relative to the size of their body as well, much bigger than ours would be relative to the size of a human body, uh, to allow them to pump that oxygen and pump blood around their body to try and maintain their sprint for as long as possible. But even with that being said, when they get up to their top speed, they can only maintain it for between 30 and 60 seconds before they overheat so much that they can't carry on, they tire themselves out, have to sit down again. So they do need to get within striking range of maybe about 20 meters before they'll actually break into a sprint. When they do break into that sprint, they can accelerate from zero to 112 kilometers an hour within three seconds. It's faster than most sport cars can even manage. So you can see that they're doing what cats do best behind me here at the moment, which is being quite lazy. And as you can imagine, we need to encourage them to actually get their exercise. This is where STEM can come into the process in terms of helping us enrich the lives of these animals by mimicking the wild and getting them to do what they do best, which is sprint after some food. So how is STEM helping to improve the cheetah's environment in captivity? Behind me is the park's cheetah race. The race is an opportunity for cheetahs to perfect the art of hunting and to attain quite high speeds while doing so. How does it work? Food is suspended from a lure. Now, the lure is attached to a zip wire. And the rangers can operate the race from a control room, which houses the technology that determines the speed at which the race will operate. Usually, speeds in the region of 60 to 65 kilometers an hour can be attained as the cats chase after their meal. So essentially the cheetah run that operates in the enclosure behind us here allows our cheetahs to express natural behaviours and mimic the hunting that they would carry out in the wild here in captivity as well. So now we'll hand you back over to our colleagues in the Galway Atlantic Aquarium. Wow, 100 kilometres an hour and 7 metres in one leap. Unbelievable. I think for anyone who comes here to the wildlife park, seeing the cheetah race in operation is probably one of the highlights of their visits, uh, Sarah. But having said that, it's so important that people recognise uh, the important role that STEM is playing in, in improving their captive environment and how we've progressed, how STEM has progressed uh, so much within the last 20 years as well. So it's 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 amazing to see that even since I arrived in Photo Wildlife Park back in 1995, how things have changed. Absolutely, and improving the animals' um, health and well-being and natural behaviours as well in enclosures. Uh, I'm going to be down soon to watch that cheetah race, I'm telling you that much. <laughs> we would welcome you all with open arms to Cork. <laughs> From Galway, your last animal, trying to beat the cheetah. How are you going to do that? Well, there was only one animal we could think of that might stand a chance against the incredible cheetah. Um, and that was amazing footage from, wildlife, uh, from Photo Wildlife Park. 
we would like to introduce you to some sharks. Everybody loves sharks. We have a whole range of fabulous Irish shark species to share with you. I'd like to introduce you to some of the ones that live at the aquarium and some that swim in Irish waters. Sharks and stem. Yes, I hear you say, what could stem have to do with sharks and in particular shark conservation? Well, let me introduce you to some of these beautiful baby sharks and rays that live at Galway Atlantic Aquaria and explain to you some of the amazing things about them and then how science is really important. Here we have some mermaids purses or egg cases. This is where a lot of our sharks and skates come from. Some sharks and rays give birth to live young, but lots of sharks and skates lay these eggs. I know, you heard me right, eggs, a bit like birds. Here on the image in front of us, we have three different species, blonde ray, thornback ray, and greater spotted dogfish. These are all types of animals that live around Ireland. And you can also see on the screen, the little egg case. Sharks are incredible animals. They evolved millions and millions of years ago. They were one of the first fish to live in our oceans. Shark's skeleton is not made from bone. It's made from cartilage. You'll be able to feel what cartilage feels like by just like feeling the top of your ear there. It's one of the reasons why this baby bullhus can curl up in this tiny egg. When the female shark would lay the egg, they'd lay it so that it attached onto pieces and fronds of seaweed, like the one in the picture. The other types of animals we saw earlier, like the rays and the skates, which had the eggs that didn't have those kind of curly tendrils that that one there did, they would lay their eggs down in the sand so that those pieces would be kind of pushed into the sand and the egg would be kept kind of upright. Now, this is another shark that we have in the aquarium. This is a starry smoothhound, another fabulous animal. And this one here, this is an image of an animal called a white skate. It's one of the largest skates that we get around Irish shores. And again, it lays a mermaid's purse. But it's not the largest. Here we have some amazing footage of basking sharks. And this was taken off the coast of County Clare here in Ireland. This footage was recorded by the Irish Basking Shark, GMIT, and the Irish Whale and Dolphin Group. We can see this really amazing behaviour here where the sharks are all swimming around in circles. The work that scientists do in following and monitoring these animals is really important so we can learn a bit more about them. We know the basking sharks come here during the summer, but we're not too sure where they go during the winter months when they're not feeding on plankton. Now I'm going to click pause. Ah, oh, I did it too early. I'm going to try again. Play and pause. Yes. Do you see the little yellow color there that's just at the back of the fin on the back of the shark? That's a tag. So that's one of the work that scientists do when they study these animals off our coastline. They place tags on them so that they can monitor their movements so that we can learn more about them. If we can learn more about them, then we can help protect them. I suppose that's what it's all about. Here they're in feeding on plankton, tiny microscopic plants and animals in our ocean. Sharks are often top predators in our ocean. So they give us a really good indication of our ocean's health. If we have good shark populations, that indicates a good, healthy ocean. Here in Ireland, the ocean's really, really important for us. We're an island nation who has a marine territory which is more than 10 times the size of our island. This real map of Ireland as well isn't just all the same underneath the water. It's all different depths. You can see here on the map in the aquarium how we go from the shallow coastal areas all the way out into the deep areas of the porcupine abyssal plain. Now, I want to finish up by just mentioning to you how you can get involved in this kind of scientific work and helping to monitor our sharks and rays. Here we've got some of those egg cases. This time they're down on the beach. So what I want you to think about is the next time you're down on the shore, 
go and have a look. Check out and see if you can find some egg cases in the series. And if you do, report them. Send in your sighting to the Irish Purse Search Project or the National Biodiversity Data Centre. That was incredible seeing those basking sharks and how people can get involved as well um, by looking for a shark and egg cases in their local beach. Really good, loved it. Guys, we're going to be hard pressed to decide which is better. So if everyone wants to write in their comments, what's the favorite animal so far? And while they're doing that, we're going to go to some questions from the audience. If you guys are both ready. No problem. So, yeah. so the first one is, what is the best thing about your job? And we'll go to Linda first, if that's okay. I did the same thing. I think that no, can you apologies? Everyone can hear me? Yep, perfect. Just just a few technical issues as expected, Sarah, unfortunately, this morning. So the favorite thing about my job, I suppose I could speak for an eternity in terms of 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 the number of things um that make me smile here on a daily basis. I suppose the one that comes to mind is just having the honor to actually work with some of the world's most critically endangered species over the last 26 years. Um, I think anyone who's a passion for wildlife, um, particularly for someone like myself, I spent a significant amount of time in, in University College Cork studying zoology with the aim of, of ending up working uh, with species such as those here in the park itself. So um, what makes my day? The students that come through our education centre, very fortunate that we teach about 19,000 here for me every year, pre-COVID. Um, so it allows both myself and my, my fellow team members here to actually hopefully to engender that respect and that 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 love for wildlife as well which is so important same question to you noreen what's your favorite thing about your job what's the best thing <laughs> the best thing well i i often say the best thing i ever had to do was bring a turtle for an x-ray um that was actually the pictures of the x-ray that were up there uh, a vet just on the outskirts of galway city uh, took those x-rays of leon and i always think over the years that i've been working at the aquarium that was definitely a highlight for me um, but really the same as Linda was saying about Photo Wildlife Park, it's getting to work with our animals, getting to work with people, promoting conservation, respect and protecting nature. Um, you know, I suppose as being someone who works in an aquarium, we're often conscious that people maybe aren't aware of all of the amazing species that are under the sea around Ireland. We're an island. We have a marine territory more than 10 times the size of our island of Ireland, over 220 million acres of land under the sea. And so, you know, we just have these incredible species. So to be able to give people just even like a little glimpse of life under the oceans is is a privilege. And yeah, I grew up on a farm, so I never expected to work in an aquarium in Galway. So I love I love my job and I feel really lucky. I know we're, we're all so lucky to work in and be able to, you know, excite people about all these animals and different things to do with nature as well. So another question for Galway then, how deep do starfish and sea urchins live and are sea urchins poisonous? So those are great questions. I actually saw them coming in through the chat earlier. So there are some uh, poisonous yeah. species of sea urchins. They generally live in tropical areas, though, so you're OK here in Ireland. <laughs> um, while the species here in Ireland do have spines on their body for protection, they don't normally have venom in their spines, so you have nothing to worry about. Though so you do hear of people, you know, um, having been on holiday <laughs> in tropical places saying how they stood on a sea urchin and they got stung. Um, we have evidence of starfish and sea urchins down to 5,000 metres. The deepest part of the ocean in Irish waters is over four and a half thousand metres down in the Porcupine Abyssal Plain. Uh, so especially things like feather stars. But to be honest, we have only explored, you know, less than 10 percent of our oceans. So really, there's an awful lot we don't know. And it is possible that those species actually are found at deeper depths. Absolutely. I think more people have stood on the moon that have been to the deepest part of our ocean, which is yeah. pretty incredible stuff. So it's Linda, amazing. 
Sorry? I was just going to say hydrothermal vents were only discovered in 1979, which is just unbelievable. And they're such an important habitat in the abyss as well. Like, it's amazing. So, Linda, we're going to go over to you and ask how many uh, European bison are there now having come back from the brink of extinction? Well, tough, tough question. Um, from what I remember, um, the last population census was carried out in 2019. I don't think one has been carried out in the intervening years. And back in 2019, scientists discovered that there were just over 7,500 remaining in the world. Um, and more than 50% of that number is actually found between both Poland and Belarus. So I suppose the, the, the important thing to point out, Sarah, is that back in 2016, there were just over 6,500. So thanks to, to concentrated efforts by the likes of Photo Wildlife Park, we're actually generating, I suppose, a very, very important stock that, again, are going back out into the wild and doing extremely well there. Absolutely. And so maybe uh, when we can travel again somewhere, you know, people could actually visit them in the wild, which would be amazing. There might have been bread from the ones from Fota. Absolutely. I think I'm still probably waiting for my boss to actually send me out to Poland. So I'll have to have <laughs> forward. Maybe people could vote to actually send me somewhere nice. <laughs> That'd be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> So now we've got a question for both of you. What is the rarest animal that you guys have? Ooh. Noreen, would you like to go first? Will I go first? Um, so I suppose a lot of the animals we have at the aquarium are not are not rare, really, or they're, you know, they're common in Irish waters, whether they're in rivers or lakes or the ocean. But we do have some species. So like the turtles that went through the aquarium that we re we were rehabilitating, uh, those are often you know vulnerable to extinction or endangered. Um, our undulate rays that we have at the aquarium are uh, vulnerable to extinction as well. Uh, they're beautiful. You might have seen those. Remember when you saw the mermaids' purses at the start of the shark video? Uh, we also have a type of gurnard, a street gurnard that's quite rare to Galway. Um, the problem with the problem with conservation status is for the ocean, a lot of our species are unknown. So when you look up um, the IUCN red list barometer of life, you'll often see like um, inadequate data for marine species because, because there's so many species and it's hard to collect data in, in the water <laughs> and we can't see the animals as clearly. Uh, but yeah, it's, um, you know, it's wonderful to be able to maybe get in a rare species and, and like the turtles, uh, you know, help it get better and then release it if we can. Absolutely, and it's hugely important as well. So Linda, what's the rarest one you have? The, the sad reality, I suppose, is that almost every single carnivorous species on earth is, most often than not, is, is classified as being critically endangered. So among those, among the rare species that we would have here in Fota would be two of our large cats, uh, the Asiatic lions and the Sumatran tigers. Um, and both of those would have populations uh, of less than, I suppose, in the region of inner around 500 individuals, which means that they, they really are at serious risk of actually becoming extinct. Absolutely. And we found out from the videos and from this event as well what we can do. And it's really important for people to get involved. And on that note, have you got any top tips for people what they can do to help wildlife around, like in their school or in their community? Absolutely, Sarah. I suppose we've we've started a very small um, educational garden here adjacent to our education centre and Photo Wildlife Park. And the, the purpose of it was to really highlight to visiting students and schools and to members of the public about the importance of native species conservation. So we started very small. We haven't invested significant finances uh, over the last year, but what we have done is that we've opened up a wildlife haven. And we've done that by, by being very picky in terms of the, the type of plants that we've placed in that garden. Uh, everything that we've planted there, we've selected specifically to be bug friendly. Um, particularly those that would attract uh, very important pollinators like bees. Um, we know that once we get correct, then the, the, the mammals, and obviously the larger larger species, the invertebrates, they follow over a period of time as well. So making some very, very simple changes, planting up around your school garden, for example, placing bird feeders in several locations, all of those can make a massive difference in terms of attracting biodiversity to your school grounds. Yeah. Absolutely, um, that's brilliant. And Noreen? 
Yeah, I mean, the same as as Linda would say, you know, any bit of nature you can leave in place <laughs> um, is going to help in your garden, wherever you live, even if it's a window box, you know, to a meadow in the back garden, like my own here. But um, for the ocean, I suppose there's two things we often say. The first is, you know, we don't realise sometimes the impact that our carbon footprint can have on the ocean. So the ocean can be seriously affected by absorbing carbon from our atmosphere. And the pH of the water um, is affected by that. So we often say to people, you know, if you can think about your carbon footprint and think about changes, if you, you know, if you can make some changes in your daily lifestyle to even reduce that a little bit, it could be anything from the materials you buy to buy maybe, you know, reused or repurposed where you can, like like the work you do in the Rediscover Centre, Sarah, um, to thinking about, you know, if you're buying food local and in season so that it has less, like, kind of, you know, travel miles on it. Um, you know, those are things. And the other thing is to share these stories. So we've told you loads of stories today, and it's fantastic to see all the votes for cheetahs and sharks. But don't forget about the smaller animals, you know, like the red squirrels, like the like the sea cucumber. Um, I cannot believe there's that more votes for sea cucumbers. Uh, but yeah, just tell, share these stories, share these stories with other people, because the more we can create a passion and love for nature and the world around us, the more we can do to protect it. You know, you have to kind of be interested and care about something first before you're going to make a change to kind of fight for it almost. You know? Absolutely. And get out, get exploring, yeah. see what's mm. around you. We've yeah. got links as well <clears throat> on our website of all the different citizen science projects you can do. I am so sorry we can't get all th through all your amazing questions. There's literally so many of them. But we just want to say a massive thank you to Photo Wildlife Park and Galway Atlantic Aquarium and also Science Foundation Ireland who have very kindly funded the event today. It has been amazing and it's been an absolute pleasure talking with you Linda and Noreen as well. Likewise and Sarah. Thank you so much and don't forget to check out the rediscoverycentre.ie website. We have lots of really cool events and educational workshops as well. So now we're going to we finally come to the end of the battle, the great Irish zoo off, land versus sea. And we've been totting up all the results and all the votes. And unbelievably, are you ready? I feel yeah, like a yeah. drum roll is in order. <laughs> it has been 50 50 in terms of votes. So it is a draw. Land and sea have drawn. And it's been an absolute pleasure learning all about the animals today. And we want to thank everyone so much for attending today. And again, if you guys, you can re-watch this as well if you want to learn any, anything more about the animals. Yeah. So I'm going to hand over to Noreen first. Anything you want to say? Sarah, I just like to say to people, World Ocean Day is coming up on the 8th of June. There will be marine events going on all over Ireland. Get out, get exploring. And if you are in the west of Ireland this summer, if you're lucky enough to live near us in Galway, come and visit, come and see the amazing cucumbers and some of the animals. And if you can't, just get out in nature, get out into your back garden, get down onto the shore with your family and go exploring our incredible Irish wildlife. Absolutely. And Linda, over to you. Likewise, uh, Sarah, big thank you to, to you and all the team at the Rediscovery Centre and obviously Science Foundation Ireland as well. Uh, to my colleague, Noreen in Galway Atlantic Aquaria, well done, amazing work. Um, and just to say to everyone, it's been such a struggle for every zoological collection in Ireland and the UK over the last 12 months, and we really would appreciate your support. If you were really passionate about saving wildlife, then by simply coming through our gates, visiting with your family or friends or school, for example, you too can be part of our conservation efforts. Absolutely. And a huge thank you from us and well done everyone. The battle is over. So well done everyone. Bye. Take care. Bye everyone. Bye. Thank you.